is the inventor of the steam powered duvet, the clockwork bra and the singing pond and he's here today to pose a very important question. Do leeches like spirals? Jeff Ward. Okay, well, I was absolutely horrified over the weekend to see all the main speakers talking without notes. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not in that class, and um, so you'll have to forgive me if I refer to a few here. But um, I'd just like to start off by saying that uh, for those bookworms out there who uh, like browsing the net, my name may not be uh, unfamiliar, but I just want to mention that um, I'm not the esteemed American historian, as you can tell by my accent. I'm not the respected professor of psychology at the University of Essex either. And uh, nor, believe it or not, am I the revered professor of English at the University of Dundee. But, um, but Jeff, I, I use Jeff Ward, who used to play bass with a punk band called The Lurkers. No, I'm not actually. Oh. But I obviously have some illustrious namesakes. Okay, um, right, that's an image of the cover of my book which came out a couple of years ago and which is going to be the subject of this talk. Now, um, as a journalist for many years, I like to think I know a good story when I see one. And the story of the spiral really is one of the most amazing that you can conceive, that you'll ever hear of. It begins with the origins of the universe, with the Big Bang, and it continues right through the whole culture of humanity on Earth, the whole all structures of evolution, and it ends ultimately with our own anatomical, psychological, and spirit, spiritual makeup. Now, what I hope to do is to give an overview of the book. I can't cover everything that's in it because the manifestations of the spiral form or the spiral pattern are legion. At the same time, I didn't want to write an encyclopedic book which just simply listed all the different kinds of spirals and, uh, and where they appear in nature and art and so forth. I want to bring a little poetry into it and some intuition as well. Now I'm very fortunate to have um, uh, the writer of the introduction to the book, the best-selling author, Colin Wilson. Here he is pictured near his home, Goran Haven, in Cornwall. Now the purpose of the book, as I've hinted, is to reveal the importance and the significance of the spiral pattern in nature and throughout human culture from the earliest times. So the idea is that if you read the book or even after you see this presentation, you'll know what profound depths lie behind the spiral pattern, which is something which is something you may not have considered before. So how did I come in, become interested in this subject? Well, in a sense, like a lot of these things, the subject chose me. I wasn't aware that it was creeping up on me, but certain things happened a number of years ago which promoted the interest. It led me into a journey of discovery, following this eternal pattern from the sacred landscapes of England's West Country and the very limits of space and time. It began with this guy, some of you may recognise him, it was Alfred Watkins, the Hereford visionary inventor, and who in the 1920s was the author of a book called The Old Straight Track. He is credited with being the discoverer, or perhaps the rediscoverer, of lays, or ley lines, as they're more popularly known. Some say he was a suppressed psychic, and when he had uh, this vision in the countryside of, of the ley system in the early 1920s, 
It was pretty soon after a near-death experience. Um, he'd had heart trouble and nearly died, and something that um, there was uh, um, something in that experience which triggered uh, this uh, psychic experience. Now, the L Street track came out in 1925, and I think, along with many other people, after I'd read that book, I never looked at the countryside or the landscape in the same way again. <coughs> the common snail, or a common snail. Now, in that book, The Old Street Track, um, Watkins recounts an incident of one day when he was out uh, walking in the countryside, in fact, in the the Welsh borders there, and he stopped at Lantony Abbey, which is a, a ruin in the Black Mountains there. And at that time, there was an inn, and he, he stopped for a pint. And while he was refreshing himself with this, he noticed on a low wall or roof opposite him a snail with his horns extended. Rather like our friend there. Now, Watkins uses an old folkloric term for the snail, which is the dogman. And, for example, in uh, Dickens' David Copperfield, Mr. Peggotty likens himself to a dog man because he moves so slowly. Now, Watkins had a kind of a flash of inspiration. He realized that the dog man was another term, as he saw it, for the ancient surveyor who laid out these straight tracks or lays in uh, prehistory. And uh, he discovered that there are a lot of place names with the word of Dodd in them, like Doddington, Dodwell, and so on. And, and these names, they often fell onto the, onto the lines of these straight tracks. But you can imagine that for me, another crucial feature of this was the spiral shell of, of the snail. And a number of things came together in my mind at that point. It reminded me of the call bells, which I'd seen at Kilpeck Church in South Herefordshire. And the uh, Kilpeck Church is a very ancient and magical, mysterious place. Uh, it's a nodal point of a number of uh, lays, which uh, Hawkins mentions. And this is the long man of Wilmington. I should have, should have brought that one forward. This is the long man of Will Wilmington uh, hill figure, which uh, is said to depict the uh, ancient spear with two sighting staves, which uh, Hawkins likened to the horns of the snail. This is the main entranceway to Kilpeck Church. It's a 12th century, or, or building which dates from the 12th century, and it's simply festooned with dragons and serpents. It's evidence of the old homage, or the homage that was paid to the, uh, the old religions um, and the earth spirit in ancient times, I think, somehow reflected in these carvings. Now, you can see, well, I hope you can see anyway, um, there are serpents running up and down either side of the portal over there, and there's images of the green man at the top of each of the columns. And right at the top there, there is the Euroborus, uh, representing the universe and the powers of resurrection and renewal. So a lot of imagery in that doorway there, which was um, important to my thinking at that time. Which also included um, the discoveries half a century ago of the uh, pioneering dowser, Guy Underwood and who detected spiral energy patterns in the landscape. And it would found that these lines converged on or, and uh, emanated from springs just below the surface of the centers of Neolithic sites such as Stonehenge and Avebury. Now, this is an example of the kind of energy lines that were being doused, this particular one um, is drawn from the Merry Maiden stone circle in Cornwall. And the, the spinal pattern there is quite obvious. Now, what the dowsers like uh, 
Underwood, and indeed the archaeologist T.C. Lethbridge, who's one of the great unsung heroes of the paranormal of the 20th century, um, Lethbridge also detected uh, through dowsing uh, very similar patterns, uh, spiral and, and conical shapes. What he and, uh, he and Underwood may have been detecting were the um, variations in the Earth's magnetic field, perhaps, um, uh, points where the field is drawn into eddies. Uh, fluid motion in the Earth it can generate this magnetic magnetism, and the flow lines get twist, tw twisted into uh, left hand and right hand uh, helices. Now, Colin, Colin Wilson, in fact, um, made a connection between energy flows like this and the Earth force or the serpent force. Uh, and images of spirals in Stone Age art in his book Star Seekers in 1980, which is an interesting point, but I'm, I'm jumping ahead a bit here. This is an illustration uh, from the book, um, a representation of um, a sacred site and how uh, such sites seem to retain their character of holiness over thousands of years. Uh, many Christian churches, as you no doubt know, are built on much older sites, um, Iron, Age and stuff, Iron Age and Stone Age monuments, uh, sites of ancient temples which are dedicated to some uh, god or, or moon goddess, perhaps. And uh, in, in this, um, this is not an actual place, but it, it's, a, it's an illustration of what, the kind of thing that happens where you get a, a megalithic monument, such as a, a long barrow shown here, and the, the mound, and then that may decay, and then the Christian church comes along and knows there's something uh, uh, important, sacred, revered about that site, and so sort of adopts it, brings it into its own system, and builds its, its own temple on the site. And also in that picture, you can see uh, a drawing in there the spiral energy lines coming up on the earth, or perhaps going down into it and linking the two. Now, these ancient monuments and old churches are not where they are at random, they are where they are for very good reasons, because in distant past, um, it was uh, decided to build them there because those places were deemed to be uh, special or sacred in, in some way, and perhaps where there was a concentration of, of beneficial earth energies. Now, for me, these old stones always seem to stand there as a reminder uh, to prompt our collective memory of um, something that uh, we have forgotten about ourselves or perhaps which we might yet uh, rediscover. This, in fact, on the right is the Merry Maiden Stone Circle in Cornwall, which I mentioned just earlier, and the, the uh, Castle Rig. Stone circle in Cumbria. Now, while I was pondering the manifestations of all these um, earth energies and, and patterns in the landscape, I was already aware, uh, like uh, everybody, of the structure of the double helix of the DNA molecule, which is represented here. But then I was struck that the same spiral curve uh, were repeated in galaxies thousands of light years ago, thousands of light years away in outer space. Now this is a representation of our own Milky Way galaxy, which was rendered in 2005 uh, by the University of Wisconsin. And it's long been known that uh, our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. Uh, but in that year, astronomers announced that there was also something uh, additional which was very special about it. And um, firstly, that there were a, a larger number of spiral arms than uh, were first, first or previously thought to be in existence. And also that the galaxy contained this bar, they call it a, a bar in the center which was a, a, or is about 27,000 light years on and marks it out from most of the spiral galaxies. Now, um, it is special, 
uh, bearing in mind the high proportion of spiral galaxies that there are in the universe, uh, which is about 80%. And uh, we'll come back to the um, importance of uh, the spiral arms a, a little later. Now, the astronomers at the University of Wisconsin, they established this pattern for our galaxy by using NASA's Orbiting Infrared Spitzer Space Telescope. And they sampled light from about 30 billion stars in the plane of the galaxy to build up this picture. And then the following year, um, it was reported that some um, astronomers, this time from the University of California, had found um, a galaxy uh, which was actually in the shape of the DNA double helix. Now here we have a picture of a very famous spiral galaxy. This is, a, it is the M51, known as the, also known as the Whirlpool Galaxy, for obvious reasons. Now there's an interesting story attached to the history of the observation of this galaxy. In the middle of the 19th century, uh, one Lord Ross built a, for that time, giant telescope in Ireland. And he was the first, or sort of among the first, to observe this particular celestial object through a high magnification telescope. And he wasn't able to photograph it at that time, but um, numerous drawings were taken from the image they could see through the telescope. And people around Europe were absolutely enthralled by this because it was the first time such an object had been seen in any detail in such a large magnification. And one person in particular in Europe who thought to have been influenced by these drawings, which were very widely circulated, was the person who painted this. which of course is the famous star in our painting by Vincent van Gogh. And you can see a similarity, it's, although the actual image is perhaps turned through 90 degrees, there's still the central swirl and the outlier. Okay, so what is the difference then, between a spiral and a helix? A spiral is a line that moves constantly away from a central point, like the helter-skelter there. If you extrapolate from that, send the, the curve vertically or uh, up, up or down, it will either go to a vanishing point or keep expanding indefinitely. A helix is a spiral that always turns about its same diameter like a corkscrew. So you can think of it as the difference between a helter-skelter helter ride and the rifling in a gun barrel, or a corkscrew. I'd just like to pause for a moment just to um, also mention the etymology of the word spiral. It's related to the words spirit and spiritual, and it comes from Latin. Spiralis, spira, or spirari to breathe, which becomes very important in this story. If you try a, a little thought experiment uh, and you think of the word spiritual in your mind's eye now, take out the words, or take out the letters I, T, and U, and what are you left with? I want to talk a little about the magical tradition. Occultists believe that all things are governed by secret laws, with hidden connections and correspondences between many things which on the surface didn't appear to be linked. Connections which are becoming more familiar to today, to us today is in theories of high energy physics, astrophysics and molecular and evolutionary biology, where the sciences seem to be converging. Uh, our example is the ancient um, anima mundi idea of, of the world soul, which is reflected in James Lovelock's Gaia theory. And in quantum theory, uh, 
which maintains the experimenter influences the experiment. This reflects the belief of the Renaissance alchemists. Now, the occultist's notion was that all phenomena can some, contain something of the divine, and that man, on a tiny scale, was a reflection of God and the universe. You might have heard the phrase, as above, so below, as within, so without. This is the Hermetic dictum attributed to this chap, Hermes Trismegistus, or three times great, which is the Greek name given to the ancient Egyptian god of wisdom, Thoth. That is Thoth, with the head of the Ibis. Thoth was the keeper of knowledge that opened the door to immortality. He had a lot of jobs. He was the patron of alchemists. He was the founder of magic. He believed to be the scribe of the gods and the inventor of writing and all arts dependent upon it, including astronomy, magic, and medicine, and as a guide to the souls of the dead. But for this topic today, importantly, he also presided over geometry and land surveying, which harks back to what I was saying earlier about Watkins and the straight track, and the earth energies, the vase, and so forth. So to me, the spiral was a perfect example of as above, so below, because by now I think you're beginning to see how this form exists on both the unimaginably huge level, the macrocosm, and also in, on the vanishingly small level, the microcosm. Who's this? May West. And one of May West's famous quips was, a figure with curves always offers a lot of interesting angles. And I think also by now you can see that that is the case with the spiral curve. Okay, the spiral or spiritual path. Now the idea of a path that could be climbed in stages to reach enlightenment has been fundamental to exponents of magic down the centuries, to systems such as the Kabbalah, the Jewish religious philosophy, in Druidry, and it came to be rendered as a spiral path. We can see this in the three and two dimensional initiatory mazes of antiquity, known spiral processional pathways, which probably existed, uh, such as here at Glastonbury Tor in Somerset, and at Silver Hill in Wiltshire, I mean, this is an artist's impression of um, how the building of the largest man made man in Europe was undertaken. In Tantric Yoga, Kundalini, which is the Sanskrit word for spiral, and which also suggests serpent power, rises through the bodies in this body in a series of seven energy centers or chakras. The aim being to activate the spiritual psychic energy by using various yogic techniques to raise it from the lowest to the highest chakra. And Kundalini is often depicted as a coiled serpent. Buddhist myths, legends, scripture and folklore uh, mentions Nagas, uh, all kinds of serpentine beings, including deities of the ocean and mountains, spirits of the earth, and the realm beneath it, and finally dragons. That leads to the birth and the death of world ages and to the eternal regeneration of time. Major examples of this are found in, at the Naga temples of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It's my belief, and this is a central theme of my book, that all serpent and dragon symbolism ultimately, and its relationship to earth energies, ultimately derives from the spiral pattern in nature. You can imagine the coils of the snake serpent uh, being, super, being superimposed over that image. I think this, is, this must be how the serpent came to be a symbol of cosmic forces and a metaphor for spiritual rebirth and renewal. It's a nice just sort of traditional depiction of a dragon. In both ancient Cambodia and ancient Egypt and in Central America, the serpent was an image of eternal life and of the cycles of the universe. Let's talk a bit about 
bit about psychology. This is the eminent Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung, who died in 1960. I make mean, no apologies for being a classical uh, Jungian in Outlook. He, he described the upward spiraling of the Kundalini serpent as the urge of realization which naturally pushes, pushes man on to be himself. Now, Jung had this uh, term individuation, which he regarded as a natural process in all people, uh, but aided by the will, which led to self-actualization, self-realization, and eventually wholeness. This was the individuation process, and Jung always likened this to a spiral progression. His famous quote was, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. You did look within yourself and you commune with the universe. Jung's myth of consciousness was that we are the universe looking back on itself. <clears throat> okay, a little section now on maths and geometry. They won't get too heavy. I'm not a mathematician. I only look at this in a layman's way. But it's important to understand uh, a few aspects of geometry to get the whole picture here. Now, in mathematics, there are many different kinds of spiral. In fact, there are, there are seven major types. But I'm only going to mention uh, two which interest me most, which are the equiangular spiral, which is this, and its close relative, the golden spiral. Now, the uh, remarkable property of the equiangular spiral, which was so named by Descartes, is that it's the only mathematical curve which increases by growth at one end, but keeps the form of the entire figure. This is a characteristic known as self-similarity. So that means, however far you extend those lines, in the center or the end, you know, you go extend it for millions of miles and always keep that shape. The spiral is called e e equiangular spiral because of another special property. If you take that straight line, C to, C to D, isn't it? Uh, the horizontal line there. And you, you drawn through the central point, or the pole, as it's called. And it goes through to any point on the curve. It always crosses that curve at exactly the same angle. Hence, equiangular. Now, in the time of Descartes and before, this um, spiral was known and the, the pole and was uh, called the Eye of God, which to me somehow relates to ourselves being observed by eternity. If you think of the extrapolation from a figure like that into the macrocosm, extension becomes in. I don't know if you can see this too, too clearly from where, where you are. Okay, hopefully. This is a golden spiral um, to which the structure of the equiangular spiral is closely related. Now, um, Related to patterns governed by what's known as the golden ratio, golden ratio or divine proportion. Um, golden spirals are created by constructing quarter circles inside the squares of golden rectangles, which hopefully you can see in, in this diagram. Uh, they have the proportion of 1 to 1.618. And uh, they have a special property that when a square is cut off, the remaining shape is another golden rectangle. And you're probably all carrying credit cards and cash cards um, and golden rectangles as near as in that proportion. The Nautilus. One of the most beautiful manifestations of the spiral in nature is the shell of the Nautilus, which is a marine mollusk uh, related to the squid. It closely approximates the proportions of the golden ratio. 
And you can see how this resembles the previous two uh, diagrams and other images we've seen so far. Now the golden ratio, which uh, many of you may know, is integral to the geometry of antiquity uh, in the construction of their sacred buildings, such as the Giza pyramids and the Greek Parthenon. Now the ancient Egyptians term for the golden ratio, they didn't call it that because the golden ratio was a term devised by Leonardo da Vinci. They simply called it Neb, and the translation of Neb is, would you believe it, the spiralling force of the universe. It also means Lord, and it appears in the names of a number of the pharaohs, and was used among the sacred names of the Sphinx. Now, this same spiral curve, which we've been looking at here, is found throughout the natural world in tusks, in teeth, in claws, and beaks of birds. It's also there in many aspects of human anatomy. The curve of the pelvis, the mechanisms of the inner ear, the fibres in the ventricles of the heart, which push the blood onward. Even the hair on our heads grows in a spiral about the crown. The horns of animals. I remind myself of the name of this creature. This is the big horned mountain sheep or ram of North America. wave patterns. You can see the same curve there in the volumes of waves. And the swirl of, of weather systems. This is a hurricane system. Which is that is Hurricane Floyd from 1999. The curve is also found in the plant world quite conspicuously in the successive sproutings of shoots from a stem or a branch which also twist into a helicoid shape and into shapes like this which is the a species of tropical vine called the toothbrush tree or tooth stick and you can see the wonderful Spiral there, also relating back to the, the golden spiral formation. So, the point I'm trying to make is that these spiral energy fields are all around us and within us everywhere. They pattern our existence. From the tiny vortices of subatomic part particles in the DNA molecule to the awesome island universes, universes of the galaxies. This, this uh, image here is of the patterns of subatomic particles interacting in a bubble chamber. You can see how they are colliding and spinning off in spirals. So it seems that, um, and just before I go on, here's another, another small spiral galaxy to leap from the microcosm to the macrocosm once again. There's the M101. So it seems that the spirals uh, is the spiral is nature's most favourite pattern of growth and its most efficacious deployer of its energy. It induces protects and it supports life. In fact, the spiral arms of galaxies, as I hinted at earlier, are the places where new stars are born and where the conditions for life are created. We are only here because of the interactions among stars billions of years ago, creating the elements which make up our bodies. So the implication ultimately is that the spiral form is integral to strength and growth. And it might be that all curves of growth are based on it. It's a powerful example of how nature tends to repeat the use 
a successful design over and over again on every level of his creative handiwork. Indeed, to me, it seems that it's the most uh, universal design of all. And as we've seen, it's there in art, religion, and philosophy from the most ancient times. It's there in earth divination, event patterning, occult belief, magical systems, and in aspects of the study of many sciences, including astronomy, quantum physics, psychology, biology, anthropology, and zoology, and even in crop circles. This is a famous crop circle formation near Stonehenge in uh, 1999. And you can see, amazingly enough, that same shape cropping up again, whether man-made or not. Still a remarkable formation made up of 151 separate, separate circles. And the story, of course, with this famous crop circle is that it appeared within half an hour. Somebody flew over that area in a light aircraft at about half past five. When they came back, it wasn't there. When they came back at 10 to 6, there it was. Now, in my researches for the book, I found representations of the spiral from all over the globe and from the most ancient times. This is the oldest known representation of a spiral in art. It's a heptad, or a spiral which turns seven times into the centre, on a mammoth ivory uh, from Siberia and dated to 23,000 years ago. So our ancestors were on to the significance of the spiral form from a pretty early time. This is Newgrange in the Boyne Valley in Ireland, a very famous uh, and neolithic site. And this is the famous portal stone depicting spiral forms. and the famous triple spiral uh, carving from actually inside the chamber. Now these kinds of uh, designs occur all over the world. This is from the Anasazi people in the southwest of America. To me it's a global phenomenon which is part of the proof that uh, Humans have always sought a dialogue with the forces of creation. The spiral is evidence that a spiritual technology or structure was in place. To me, it's an archetypal symbol, symbol which corresponds to the underlying reality of nature. And I think today that we're starved of such symbols that can speak to us and deliver meaning into our lives. So, I think that the spiral is indeed the way of the universe. It's the link between microcosm and macrocosm. It's how the universe actually shapes up. It's become clear to me that it's the uniting symbol right across nature and human culture. It appears as a sign of the eternal, creative and organizing principle at work in the universe. And is also, importantly, a symbol of our spiritual development. Now, you may think that with the spiral simply everywhere, and it is, that it points to a certain intelligence underlying the existence and the development of the universe over billions of years, and indeed our consciousness of it. Now, this is a difficult question, obviously, but it's spiritual experience which seems to put us in touch with this intelligence through our consciousness, or sometimes altered states of consciousness. And it's an interesting sidelight to recall that Francis Crick, who was one of the pioneers um, in the discovery of the uh, helix-shaped DNA molecule, he actually had a, had a vision of that while he was on an LSD trip. It wasn't something that he formulated on paper, he was experimenting with LSD. 
and on, on one of his trips, he intuited that shape for the DNA molecule. Not widely known, but true. Now it was George Bernard Shaw who saw the universe as having begun as a whirlpool of pure force. Something like this, perhaps, at the moment, or the moment soon after, the Big Bang. And he believed, or envisaged it, becoming a whirlpool of pure intelligence, ultimately. It's within this mystery that the secret of our existence lies. And I believe, and I've only touched on a few aspects, despite this somewhat roller coaster ride of information, I've only touched on a few aspects of the manifestation of the spiral. It was integral to the wisdom of the ancient world, as far as I've been able to establish, and I think it should be reclaimed for us today. And that rounds off, or winds up, if you excuse the pun, what I have to say this afternoon. And if anybody would like to ask any questions, I'll try to answer them. And if anybody's interested in the book, I have some copies, as you might expect. So, thanks very much for listening. Just, just a quick response to that. Um, that's very interesting because in, 
most of the burial traditions, the spiral for shamanism is left to them to go in with. Yeah. And for more out more bird forms of spirituality into the opposite is the cord wires are a right way to them. Yeah, there's a very interesting illustration of this actually in a, a story by Edgar Allan Poe, which uh, some of you may have, have read called um, Descent into the Marsmont of Marstrom, where the guy goes out on a fishing boat and um, they encounter, they get caught in a storm and this huge uh, whirlpool, a vast whirlpool forms just off the coast of Norway, if I remember correctly, where there are legends of the Marstrom. And the boat gets, gets sucked into this. And uh, it's gradually being dragged down. And it's when the guy he, he, he's on the ship and he notices that um, some debris is floating up the, uh, the, the whirlpool. He jumps off the boat onto one of these spars and is carried to safety. And that's where these objects were turning to the, to the right instead of being dragged down. Uh, he, he was uh, brought up to the surface and, and saved. So th this idea of a difference between the right hand, right turning, left turning, and the spirals is, uh, is, is quite sort of diffuse through culture as well. Heather. Do you think that of these things must be known as long as people existed? If you think our gut is a spiral. Do I think, sorry? No, if, if you think that the, the concept of the spiral must have been known to people as long as people existed. I believe so, yes. They, <coughs> I, I, I um, our gut, little gory, but our gut, if you open someone up, is a spiral. Yes. A I, perfect spiral, the kind you describe like a book. Yeah, um, yes, that's another example of how it is, uh, appears in our own anatomy. But to their uh, minds, they would have known what their insides yeah. existed. Well, no, well, I, I don't think it was that so much. I think that um, it, but when you go back a, a long way, I think the human mind is the recognition of symbols, or shall we say patterns rather, is hardwired into the human brain. And I think. Um, it was an evolutionary characteristic. Um, it was needed because um, in the earliest times uh, the world must have been a pretty hostile place. And the recognition of patterns uh, would have been important. You know, weather patterns, water patterns, and patterns of, of, of animal movements. And the, the spiral patterns that is maybe represented in the coil of a snake or in a whirlpool. And these were readily recognisable, and that's where I think that the, you know, these intuitive ideas came from originally. So I think from, well, you've seen there that example of the heptad on the mammoth ivory dated to 20,000 years, 23,000 years ago. Um, that's a pretty good example of um, how uh, these patterns were being perceived as long ago as, long ago as that, and were being given or a numinous quality. Anybody else? Yes, somebody at the back. Again, I apologise for not being able to recognise the people at the back. My God. On Friday evening, one of the um, chaps was talking about he, he was a crop circle maker and he believed that by creating these crop circles himself, sort of induce a number of coincidences to happen by creating a sort of en energy, you put energy into crop circles. So I was curious that you mentioned crop circles and um, the significance of, of spirals. Um, I, I was just interested to, to know how, how you respond to that whether that would surprise you or, or interest you, or if you had some sort of explanation. Well, I don't have any explanation, but it certainly does intrigue me. And I, um, I don't call them crop circles generally, I call them crop spirals, because the vast number of, 
I have to use the term crop circle formations, involve a spiral curve in one way or another. And the image that I showed you earlier was a classic example of, um, although it was foreshortened because of the angle at which the photograph was taken, it was in fact you know, a, a big angular spiral shape in, in the field there. Um, to me, uh, whether they're man-made or not doesn't really matter to me. I think the fact that, that in terms of the spiral pattern coming through again, that is the, the important thing. And uh, I mean, you can, I touched on the magical tradition there, and I think it is quite true that um, you know, visualization is the first step on the road to magic. And once you visualize uh, patterns like this on a grand scale in crop fields, I think you, know, you are, you know, disturbing or realigning energy patterns. I think that, that's possibly uh, quite possible because we're all, we're not just sitting here as individuals in isolation, we're all participating in the same energy fields. And these are essentially spiral energy fields. They're all around us, they're within us. You know, it's <clears throat> the question that one wants to ask is why? Um, I think I may have partially explained that, but why should they be spiral forms? Well, it's because of the, 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 the strength of them, they, uh, they promote longevity, uh, there's a protective um, element to it, um, there's a, a life-inducing element to it. Um, so that's probably why spiral, but how is probably an even deeper question, because if you think, what are the forces acting on matter and energy? to turn it into spiral configurations. That is uh, an unanswerable question to me, which lies at the heart of the, of the book that I've written. And I do um, look at that particular point, and there are certain theories which might fit into um, a tentative explanation of that, but they're getting into a very deep water starting to look at that. So as far as crop circles are, <clears throat> are, are concerned, or crop spirals as I really prefer to call them, I think the fact that those spiral curves are being used is, is extremely significant, whether they are man-made or not. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I always hate having to cut short a question and answer session, but we are coming towards the end of the day. Jeff, once upon a time, there were an awful lot of journalists I knew. Once upon a time, the CSA had a lot of friends who were journalists. We had quite a big connection of them. But as you know, my father was taken ill three years ago. And in the year or so it took to nurse my father through his final illness, deal with the aftermath of his death and everything else, basically we lost all our connection to people except one. There was this weird guy up. And we always print the stories we sent him from a paper called the Western Daily Press. It's taken three and a half years, I think, for, for us to actually meet him. He sent me his book a long time ago, and again, I've been promising to have one for him again for quite a long time. I'm very, very glad 